So I'm very excited to be discussing um, a, a movie with you. Uh, I have some specific questions, and then it can take us wherever you want us to, to lead us. Sure. Uh, I was thinking maybe to start with a relatively easy question, which was um, how and when did you become aware of Ellen Keller activism and involvement in the Socialist Party? Because personally, even so I love Ellen Keller uh, as a spokesperson, I was not aware about how involved she was uh, with, with these causes. Yeah, um, I, I certainly growing up, I was, I had the sort of general cognizance of who Helen Keller was and, and uh, um, uh, had seen at least the film version, Arthur Penn's film version of the Miracle Worker, which um, had impressed me, I think. But um, it was much later in life. Uh, um, uh, it was through the um, writings of um, uh, radical historian Howard Zinn that I first uh, became aware that that there was this whole um, dimension of Helen's life that had been, you know, um, let's say minimized in many of the orthodox biographies and uh, um, um, outwardly suppressed in, in, in other literature that's out there. Um, um, much the same way that the, the more radical sides of people like Rosa Parks or Martin Luther King Jr. Um, have also been kind of um, um, sanitized for, for popular consumption. And so, that was over 20 years ago when I first um, uh, came upon that. It was at, at a time when um, uh, I'd gotten to know Howard and I was reading a lot of his work. And as you know, I made an earlier film inspired by his work. <clears throat> and um, so actually this film was something that I started um, uh, with the intention of making um, over 20 years ago. And I was researching it for about a year and um, gradually, I kept coming up against the fact that while I could find um, copies of certain speeches she had written and, and articles, um, I could find almost no imagery, um, uh, either film footage or stock footage or photographs or audio recordings um, during quite a long swath of her life, you know, um, when she was, um, I mean, I, uh, I can talk about this later, but I, mean, I think she was uh, um, an avowed socialist uh, through the entirety of her adult life. But um, there's a period that's where she's most outwardly um, uh, uh, active in the movement, and um, <clears throat> and at a time when she, you know, she was internationally famous. Um, um, uh, so it puzzled me that someone who had um, was such a renowned figure, um, why there wouldn't be, um, at least I couldn't get my hands on uh, um, the kind of things that a documentary filmmaker looks for, you know, the, 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 the raw materials to make the film. And so I um, had some suspicions that about... Um, her principal archive, which is the American Foundation for the Blind, um, uh, because of the kind of contentious relationship they had around her um, political beliefs and the fact that um, the outward expression of those political beliefs, um, not wholly, but uh, largely um, diminished once Helen became the public spokesperson and, and fundraiser for the American Foundation for the Blind it's around 1924. From that point on, she's involved with the AFB for the remainder of her life, pretty much. Um, things change, and so I surmise that those around her said, you know, if you're really committed to helping raise money uh, for our organization, kind of cease and desist about these other matters that, that you also um, obviously care about. Um, so, uh, I, I can't swear by this, but I, I think there might have been um, a, a disinterest in their part in gathering their archives around her work to, to maintain that material. Um, uh, I also learned that there was a second collection of uh, 
her, her um, archive called Helen Keller International, and this is mentioned in the, later in the film, that um, right around the time that I was starting to research doing a film on this that um, was destroyed um, on September 11, 2001, um, uh, from debris that fell from the South Tower of uh, the World Trade Center. And at that point, I thought, okay, you know, in theory, this is an interesting idea, but for a filmmaker, you know, there's, I just don't know that there's anything I can do with this. And <clears throat> let it go. Fast forward many, many years later, um, uh, let's say three or four years ago, I, I, I finished um, uh, another film um, called Wake Subic and trying to ruminate about what I might work on next. And this idea starts re-emerging and um, I hear this a voice in my head saying, okay, you want to make a film about the most famous, iconic, blind, deaf woman? Um, you have no images, you have no sound. Um, that you shouldn't shy away from that. That's actually an interesting creative challenge to, 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 to confront. So that's where it started, um, and more, more uh, earnestly. And um, you've seen the film. It's not like there are no images or no sounds, but, um, but it was a, a, a long process of figuring out how, how to make a film about that subject and about the past when you don't have all the, the elements that one would uh, traditionally imagine going into such a, a work. It's an interesting parallel that you're making the documentary without sounds and images talking about a woman who was not able to see, speak or hear. Uh, you're both going into uh, unknown territory uh, in a way. Uh, so the way you process um, our voice is uh, very interesting because you have like different way of uh, combining uh, our speeches. So sometimes it's like block of text uh, that can seem a little dense on the screen. Sometimes it's like this short like uh, question and answers in a theater with the, uh, the piano in the background. Sometimes there's a narration uh, by uh, a poet, uh, Caroline uh, Fouché, and with a beautiful voice. So, and it always is mixed with uh, imagery of uh, nature and uh, small pieces of moving nature. Uh, so how did you uh, decide to present our, our, our voice or speeches uh, this way? And how was the process of determining that was the right balance for, for you? Um, it's a slow organic process of, of uh, thinking about um, uh, strategies to to work with this material. Um, it, it came together in stages of, of my my just working with it over time. Um, I a uh, key um, epiphany for me, in a way, was uh, as I was um, involving myself more and more in her writing and reading her. Um, uh, various biograph uh, biographies, but her autobiographies, which there are, are multiple, um, uh, discovering that she had such a passionate relationship to her surroundings and to the natural world and wrote so eloquently um, in ways that I don't even quote in the film, but just uh, uh, with great sensitivity and, and uh, awareness of, of, of the beauty that um, she found in 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 wilderness of a kind, um, and um, that has been a central uh, part of my own being uh, and a component of of previous films of of mine. Um, there's a sort of pantheistic uh, dimension that I connected with, and when I when I found that um, that that was so pronounced in in, in Helen. Um, it was uh, an additional bonding that 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 I'd already had with her with her political um, views, and I felt that um, that what that um, enabled me to bring those elements into the film, and maybe they feel um, 
disconnected or, or enigmatic through part of the watching the film, but hopefully when you, the last quote in the, the sort of vaudeville sequences, the quote, the, those question and answers are part of a way of rendering a period of about four years where um, Helen and Anne Sullivan, um, in order to make a living uh, more easily than just being on the lecture tour, um, agreed to go on the vaudeville stage and do this 20 minute routine that ended up, ended with questions from the audience. And I put together over a period of time, a compendium of, of those and selected ones that um, resonated with the, the overarching themes of the film. So um, that last question where she's asked what she values most in life and speaks about her love of nature, um, hopefully that helps to bring back into focus why, why that's uh, been made integral to the structure of the film. Uh, in terms of how to, how to work with her text in the absence of images, um, I was very reluctant to have an actor portray Helen or to um, uh, invoke, invoke um, her, her way of speaking or even, even um, uh, just sort of tell you how to, how to read those texts. I felt that, um, you know, I'm sure for many people reading on screen is, is seems anti-cinematic or something. To me, it's just another element and I have no problem with it. Um, you know, many of us don't read as much as we should and I um, uh, felt I was perfect, you know, I, I always make films as if I'm the first audience member of my own film and I have to make the film that I myself want to sit down and watch and, and I'm comfortable with watching and I was absolutely comfortable um, um, spending time with, with those words and those thoughts. Um, so, um, uh, but figuring out, you know, how much to fit on a page and how to pace them, how long to even, just practically how long to leave them up, hoping that people have the, the time to, to get through them um, uh, without having to pause their screen or whatever. Um, yeah, so, and then, um, Bringing Carolyn into this, um, uh, I, um, I had the great pleasure of working with Carolyn for my previous film, Wake Subic. Um, 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 enormous admirer of her, her work, um, and I highly recommend if people haven't read her recent memoir, um, What You Have Heard Is True. To me, it's one of the, already one of the great books of my life. Um, but um, uh, I had, thought for a while when I was making the previous film that uh, um, the, when people do narrations of voiceovers and films, we, we almost never see them and, and um, we should see them and it might help to chip away a little bit of that classic documentary problem of the sort of voice of God um, narrator. And, um, but that film, Wake Subic, was a um, part of a diptych of a previous film Vapor Trail Clark, and I hadn't done that technique in the first film, and I wanted them to be parallel, so I just kept that idea in abeyance. For, and then when this project came along, um, uh, I reached out to, to Carolyn, and um, she was very uh, intrigued with what she read about Helen that I presented her with. And uh, she didn't, uh, to be fair, she, um, and she, she will tell you this, she, um, she didn't know I was gonna put cameras in the recording room until, we, until she showed up. Um, uh, um, but she was game and, um, uh, yeah. Where, where is she based? Um, she's based in, uh, um, the, um, DC, mm -hmm. Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. I mean, you mentioned that it's enigmatic, um, you know, like especially the nature shots. I felt it tied very well together. Um, it made me feel into the, the spirit of that woman. And um, I partly enjoy reading the text even so, yes, they were long and I was like uh, training myself to see if I could read enough because I read a little slower in English or if I needed to pause and if I, you know, but when you read aloud, it's, it's slower too. 
but there's enough time and I think the sense of timing you give it, it's, it just, it's just perfect. It's very tricky because if it goes too fast, you don't have time to think about it and think what you're really reading. Uh, and if it's too long, then you have a sense of slowness that might be detrimental to the spirit of the film. So it, it, it worked really well and I think it's probably why the movie moved me so much. Uh, as well as like learning, uh, you know, like some part of American history that I was not completely familiar with. Um, but, but there's a, a sense of uh, timing of the film too, even though so you've been working on this for a long time on and off or who are thinking about it. Seeing this today felt extremely timely to me. Uh, and the fact that uh, Ellen Keller was a completely modern woman, because all the causes she's talking about and what she's studying and what she's um, sharing are things that are still totally pre uh, like prominent in America today. Uh, not a lot of things have changed. Um, things, actually it's really frowned upon to be a socialist ever since, uh, you know, like the, the 20s. And is that something you were conscious about when you were making the film that, uh, you know, are, it completely spoke to us today? I mean, I should have said that um, at the beginning, but that's, ex that's precisely what, it wasn't just the fact that uh, learning that she, uh, that this part of this woman's life had, had been um, suppressed and, and um, hidden away. Um, it was it was precisely what you're saying that that, that I saw the pertinence and the the, um, uh, the connection between so much of what she said to our current historic moment that um, I I felt okay it's a hundred years later but Helen still has many things to say to us and and we should be hearing them and and um, uh, um, so I you know was particularly happy that this film is finally out um, uh, at least a little bit before our um, looming presidential election here. Um. Always a positive note to think about this. Uh, there's a little bit of humor in the film too, like mostly with the vaudeville uh, session and the, the question uh, and answers. Um, and there's one that I thought was uh, partly suited for you, <laughs> which was uh, when she graduated from Radcliffe and she talked about Harvard and the dead ideas, uh, which was also pretty uh, extraordinary coming from her uh, because she, she learned based from nothing and she goes to Radcliffe from Harvard, uh, which is still today known as, you know, the epitome of ideas and exchange and, and, and growing and, and she is very straightforward with this. Yeah. So something you would like to, to share with us about yeah, the dead I mean, of uh, Well, if I, if I ever screen the film there, I'll be, I'm sure that will get one of the biggest laughs in, uh, in the film. Uh, but, you know, she was always very gutsy and, and, and uh, uh, um, you know, what was not shy about ex expressing herself even when, um, advised to hold her tongue um, and um, I kind of think of her sometimes almost as a as having a bit of a, a punk ethos about her um, and and maybe that's part of why I included the the punk music at at one point in the, in the film as well um, uh, um, she, you know she was a provocateur for sure in, in, in ways that I um, admire I, that was my final question with the choice of music. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned the, the, the punk uh, music because I also thought about what uh, she liked to, yes, provoke people and, and be an independent and anarchist spirit. Uh, but there's like different um, choices. I think there's a Soviet uh, course at the beginning. When, uh, there's um, Caruso or singing at some point too, which is yeah. definitely more timely with her. So you, you have a very interesting mix to represent her life and to, to talk to us about this. So can you talk about the music selection? Um, so uh, s the music that accompanies the, the vaudeville sequences are, um, I think you, you may not have time to read it and as the credits go by, but, uh, um, from my research is 
the music that was used traditionally during her routines on the vaudeville stage. And one of those pieces, the Star of Happiness, um, the melody of that was actually um, composed or at least uh, inspired by, by Helen herself. Um, but there was no recording. I, I, there don't appear to be any existing recordings of that, but um, after um, some, some digging around, I was able to find um, one copy of the original sheet music and um, uh, an old friend, uh, composer, uh, Marty Marks, who, who does a lot of scoring for silent films and uh, um, teaches at MIT. I reached out to him and he put together an ensemble and, and um, um, we brought back to life that, that score. So that's another thing that's being kind of revived through the, through the, the music in the film. The Crusoe, um, uh, it's a, it's, she, she, during that period, uh, she, she met Caruso and it was, a, it was a, another big news story and there are photographs of that. And, and, um, and it was just an aesthetic choice that, that had roots in something in her life, but I, I thought would help bridge that moment in the film. And, um, and then in terms of, the use of Bandiera Rosa, which is a classic Italian um, uh, um, 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 partisan song, um, uh, um, that's a, that's been something that I've tried to incorporate in a number of my films for 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 some years now. Of of, of since there's a, a strong and vital tradition of 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 um, left-wing songs accompanying um, uh, um, progressive movements and and um, inspiring them and propelling them and and um, and so, um, but I've tried to to use uh, not not the most traditional versions of those songs in, in my films. So um, I, I in Prophet Mode and the Whispering Wind, I, I use beautiful. Um, uh, uh, instrumental version of the International that Ani DeFranco um, gave me permission to use her company and uh, Utah Phillips did and in the Philippine films um, uh, I use uh, two versions of uh, Bella Chow, another Italian um, partisan song, um, one that um, Lab Diaz very kindly um, recorded for me in, in Tagalog and uh, another um, uh, version in, in, in the other film. And so I, I've tried to keep that idea going in, in these works and, and just happened to stumble upon this uh, Slovenian um, punk version of, of, of um, uh, Bandiera Rosa, Red Flag, and thinking about um, the, the comment that Helen makes about keeping a red flag in, in her house and, and her, her um, uh, uh, love of the red flag. and. Um, but I didn't. I wasn't uh, acquainted with 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 the group before. And but they're they're um, uh, legendary, really. Um, one of the, the first, if not the first, punk group behind the Iron Curtain, and um, uh, performed once with uh, opened, I think, for the Sex Pistols at one point. And I was able to um, reach the uh, founder of the group, um, and uh, when he uh, saw the idea I was proposing, he said to. For, to use this for a film for Helen Keller, uh, but you know he'd be honored to have it. So um, it was it was very easy to to negotiate, and um, it's actually one of my favorite parts of the, of the film. Uh, I sort of cranked up the volume even a little more in the sound mix during that section. So if you ever get to see it, folks ever get to see it in a in a theater, I've only seen it once projected in a theater so far, um, um, and uh, it really kicks ass. <laughs> Well, I certainly hope we'll have a chance to um, project it in the cinema at some point. I don't, I mean, I can't predict exactly when it will happen, but eventually I assume we will go back to some sort of uh, dark screening room with uh, some strangers around. Um, I, I thank you again for talking about your work uh, in such a thoughtful manner. It was really a pleasure to see the film and to share it with the audience. And I was really glad to uh, talk to you about this. Um, so I don't have anything 
to add, but maybe you have some final words to, to tell me or the audience. Uh, I just, I know these are some of the hardest times most of us have ever had to endure. And um, uh, um, and I think that um, Helen experienced similar dark times throughout uh, her years and yet held on to this sort of fierce optimism, um, which not that she didn't have doubts or, or depressions and what have you, like we all do, but she, if you look at the, the, the full uh, arch of her life, the, um, she was, um, uh, had a really profound conviction that things um, could change, that things, um, she talked about how um, the seeds of socialism are spreading um, far and wide and no power exists that can stop them from germinating. And, um, and she had such a belief in, in, in um, the power of the young um, to move us to uh, uh, a few steps closer to the kind of world we'd all like to live in. So um, I hope this film starts to speak to, to uh, new generations of activists and gives them some um, nutrition to for the good fight. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's a very good way to end uh, an envious, some optimism, uh, despite the darkness around us. So thank you again, John, and um, I'll see you and talk to you again soon, maybe in, in person. <laughs> we hope. <laughs> thank you, John. Take care.